Hi, Dina. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm good. You? I'm very good. Sorry, just because I'm going to Zoom. We just had an issue. No, on. all good, all good. No worries. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, shall we start with the interview? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I've been speaking with some people, and there was some, some kind of uh, sentiment that it's not the best time to buy a condo. Uh, they, some people expect that prices would go down, and there's this also another sentiment that people want to buy a bit more bigger. So that trend for uh, more value for for money is still going on. Yeah. So, what do you think? What, what do you think? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think that this is probably the most meaningful threat we've had to, to the nature of urbanization right now. Um, and it's sort of causing us to rethink the um, the decisions, I guess, that, that planning, the places to grow act, you know, provincial and national level planning has put forward, which is really focused on density, um, you know, which helps us get more people in a, in a smaller footprint. Um, this is probably the first credible threat we've seen to that, that mm -hmm. structure since we've started on that path, which maybe would have been, you know, a decade ago or, you know, more, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you agree that with condos is the buyer's market, but with homes is the seller's market, especially right now with the greater Toronto, uh, area recording a whole new record in August? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, I mean, I, I, I caution people to use an August data point because August is typically a very slow month. Um, uh -huh. I would suspect that when you compare this September to last September, it's going to be uh, unfavorable because I don't think we're going to see as much volume trade. Um, not that I think that there's anything wrong with the detached market right now, but uh, yeah. To answer your question directly, yes, I think that the condo market is in a in a buyer's market right now, and it's really just a function of there's so much inventory, and there's really no, we don't have like, there's no predictable stream of future demand, right? Like usually you can say, okay, immigration is going to hit you know a quarter million people next year or whatever, and we don't really know when that's going to return to normal, um, mm -hmm. and then you know I mean the the big piece is when you think about a the value of a property, if you think about it as an appraiser, right? Um, you know, you would look at an approach to value based on a couple of different things. The first one would be what it costs to build that thing. So how much does it cost to buy the land and then construct it? That's not really changing. Construction costs aren't really changing. If anything, they're going up. But the other piece is you value something based on the income that it produces. And right now, rents are declining in condos by, you know, 10 to 20 percent depending on the area in Toronto um, mm -hmm. and so it's not as compelling of a value proposition to purchase a condo anymore and the you know the majority of, of buyers for that product in the past five years have been investors right and and so now mm -hmm. that buyer pool has exited as well so the question becomes then are can we count on end users let's say people from my generation who want to buy and live in a condo to prop up that that demand that we need to to save these prices from slipping further, um, mm -hmm. and I don't I don't know the answer to that question. But based on what I'm seeing anecdotally in the market, I think a lot of people from my generation are are leaving the city to go live with their parents. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd be a millennial, but you know Gen Z maybe not live with their parents, but a lot of them are just, are, are are leaving the city. I think Gen Z will go back to the city. Um, it yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense for young people. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, objectively the, the condo market is, is definitely, a, it's in buyer's market territory and I expect it to be there for the foreseeable future until basically I think prices will drop to a point where you'll, mm -hmm. you'll see a rush of, of new buyers come back in and then we'll kind of, we'll find a new equilibrium. Um, I, I guess the big question then is if prices in condos decline, will that have any impact on, on detached, right? Yeah, well, the prices for detach increase, and um, it's interesting. And um, how about pre-construction? Yeah, I mean, this is the challenge, right? Like most, and this is where I think that there's actually like almost a margin of safety in the condo market because when you look at 
the pre-construction of condos, like you're basically buying an options contract, right? So you're basically buying a futures contract like you would at, uh, if you're buying a stock or you're buying an option to purchase a stock. Um, and right now, there's there, that contract is has very little value because and let's say you're buying you're buying the right to purchase this condo in or the right but also the obligation to purchase this condo in let's say five years in five years but a lot of these and this is the same thing that we saw happen in 2017 this is where there's sort of this disconnection from reality like there's no there's no risk premium built in for the for the purchaser so basically you're buying a, a unit today at let's say 1250 a square foot where you know a building a building that was that is trading on on the market today right across the street from it is selling for 850 to 900 a square foot so you are you're buying in at a 30 percent premium so i mean that obviously objectively is it's just unsafe it's not a good business practice and this is what happened in in 2017 when people were buying homes on spec that by the time they close that that home it would be worth a lot more money if you look at hillsborough and holland landing it's a really good example of where that failed a lot of people and and um so i think that there's a lot of risk in in those contracts but um i mean construction is slowing a little bit just naturally as a result of covid and maybe that that time will be on the side of investors um and you could almost maybe say a prayer that 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 froth that that speculative um you know expectation on top of the market right now is the only thing that gets erased from the condo market i don't think that's what, what's going to be the case but you know that uh-huh. that it could it could potentially be a margin of safety right because you have a, a lot of investors you have developers you have many powerful people who have an incentive to see that model succeed mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so uh so the margin the, the margin for safety is basically to buy a detached condo for the time being as opposed to pre-construction or condo because we don't know the variables of condos and pre-construction right now and uh so in, in overall how would the second wave of COVID 19 impact the real estate market in your region um, I mean, I guess I, I would say that de- depending on how, like, you know, obviously we're taking a drastically different approach to COVID than the United States, as an example. Um, de- depending on how the workplace evolves as a result of, of COVID and, mm-hmm. and, and whether or not this experiment in working from home ends up yielding positive results for both the employers and the employees ultimately like I think that it 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 would actually I think that it'll be a really good thing for or or it'll create a compelling case for life in the suburbs Um, I think a lot of people are you know realizing that there's value to having a backyard realizing that there's value to being close to you know natural heritage or a lake or forests or things to do that that you know don't involve just the the life of of urbanization which is basically you know li- living where you live working where you work and then going out to socialize in some sort of way that involves you know like the the mm-hmm. urban the urban landscape so you know going to a bar or a restaurant or whatever kind of thing you would do mm-hmm. so from my perspective i think that it's given people the the room to rethink what it means to live in an urban versus suburban area and i think that if we ultimately end up And my prediction would be, you know, we're ultimately going to end up that in some sort of work from home and work from office arrangement. And that would likely create a a greater demand for people to live in the suburbs. So I think that I think that, you know, while we might see some pressure on prices in in the suburban area as a result of just financial stress in the market, um, Mm -hmm. I think that York region, especially given, you know, transit accessibility, TTC, going to Vaughan, um, proximity to Toronto in general, I, I think that, you know, we're in a very, we're very well poised to, to weather this storm in a, in a good way. Yeah. So from the last time we talked, uh, are there any new trends? I remember speaking with you saying that there's something who actually were keen in buying in Georgina mm-hmm. or Cotton. So are there any new trends? 
trends happening right now in the New York region? Yeah, so I've uh, I've actually been watching really closely uh, waterfront property um, mm -hmm. to see basically because from my perspective, like cottages and waterfronts. Um, they're typically a very illiquid product, and I think that they were based on the, how how much impulse buying of that that type of product was being or was happening over the past couple of um, months. Uh, I, I felt that it was getting close to the, the territory in which you could you know you could describe it in hindsight as a bubble, um, and so I you know I've noticed that there's definitely been massive value growth in in the in waterfront and. Um, in cottage properties um, and there's also been a uh, speeding up of the absorption of those properties so basically they're selling faster and they're selling for more money the reason mm -hmm. that yeah the reason that that creates fear for me is because you, if you look at those properties historically they always typically cottages take longer to sell and um, they don't accelerate in value too quickly so to me you know that that it's like if you think about the sports car of properties right if you you know you you, you mm -hmm. You, it's an impulsive, impulsive purchase decision. You do it for recreational purposes, and then it, when you want to sell it in two years, it's not so easy to protect your value. My fear is that you know a lot of people might be pinned down to to assets like that when we do get back to a normal world and they don't need the cottage anymore or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any clients who moved from the city and uh, purchased a cottage or somewhere near the uh, waterfront? Yeah, I would say the majority of my of my waterfront purchases this year were people from the city who were either purchasing a second home, a summer home, or moving out of the city to... Okay, can we get in touch with people who actually moved out? Would it be possible if we could speak to them, or...? Yeah, let me, uh, let me see if I can chat, if I can get a, uh, a couple of people to, mm -hmm. to that discuss that with you. That okay. Might. Yeah, so, okay, I just want uh, to uh, thank you so much, but I just want to have one last question. Uh, so, basically, for condo buyers, you said typically, especially before COVID, you had a lot of investors, and it's kind of also dependent on immigration. So, these are the two main factors for a hot condo market. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's a couple of different factors, but if you, realistically, the, what's, what's threatening the condo market right now is the perfect storm of... of every risk variable being realized at once. So number one is that, so if you think about an investor who's purchasing in the city of Toronto, they're buying a, a condo to rent out to somebody who is like either a millennial who's working in the city, millennial or Gen Z who's working in the city, or to a student, a foreign student perhaps, who is attending U of T or Ryerson or uh, OCAD or Humber or whatever, or uh, George Brown, or they're using it for Airbnb for people traveling so, um, you know, let's just say those three elements have been erased or, they, or at least fundamentally changed overnight, right? So Airbnb investors are, are losing out. Um, investors who are renting to students are losing out. And that's why we've been seeing the vacancy rate in, in rental condos climbing to the point I think we have like almost 14,000 vacant uh, or, or sorry, rentals available on the market right now. Um, and so... I mean, I would say, yeah, investors are going to drive the demand and they've sort of walked from the market because there is no compelling investment and there's no... Investors weren't really buying for cash flow in Toronto anyway. They were buying for, va for value appreciation. Um, and, and now it doesn't look like the value is going to appreciate for the foreseeable future. But the market in North region itself, you have Vaughn, you have Richmond, yeah. you have lots of Markham, you have a lot, like, a lot of new yeah. condos. Yeah. And they even more spacious than the ones in Toronto. So how about them? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, uh, from my perspective, I think that those are, they're fungible or, or um, exchangeable with the product in in Toronto. Um, but yeah, it's just basically a better, a, a marginally better value proposition if you're centrally located on the TTC or whatever. I think that you'll see some pressure on condo prices in, in Vaughan as a result of, condo prices in Toronto being reduced. But yeah, I would say that, let's say it has a, a little bit of a, a protection mechanism because it's more end user friendly as an example. Like if you're a young couple, you want to, mm -hmm. you, you know, you could potentially live in a two bedroom condo in Vaughan and actually afford it rather than if you're living in a two bedroom condo in Toronto and you can't, right? You, you, and, mm -hmm. Or, or you, you know, you could 
sensibly raise a family in a in a in a more family friendly unit in Vaughan versus Toronto as an example. Um, mm-hmm. So like yeah, I mean it, it really just comes down to competitive. What is the competitive advantage of the product? And I think developers are really keen. Like they definitely have their finger on the pulse of how the market is behaving and what the market wants to see built. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. yeah. Would you like to add anything else? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't really think so. I mean, I guess the the one of the big questions that I, I'm getting asked a lot is whether or not prices will come down in York Region if they tend to drop in Toronto. I would say that you know when you think about a condo in Toronto, um, that sort of represents your entry level product or what would be perhaps the price floor of of what a, a, a house in the GTA could could start at. Um, and then, you know, you would exchange that for, let's say, like a house in Keswick or Bradford or, you know, somewhere where the values are kind of proximate. Um, mm-hmm. So the question becomes, OK, if somebody was buying a, a or selling a condo and stepping up into a second home, um, does that does that create a spillover effect or a ripple effect into the into the broader market of detached? And I would say yes, but I think it's going to be I don't think it's going to be as bad as most people think. So I think you know, we could see the price floor loosen a little bit and kind of come down from where it is. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't I don't think it's going to be catastrophic. I do think condos will suffer pretty badly, like, cor- you know, correction mm-hmm. level to mm-hmm. what we saw in 2017, probably. Um, mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people have realized that that was probably due to happen anyways. It's it's mm-hmm. gotten to a point yeah. where it wasn't it wasn't a it's, it's a healthy correction for the market. It wasn't affordable for the layperson to live in Toronto anymore. And that's not, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's not the kind of city that we that we all wanted to build together. That's interesting because I was walking yesterday in downtown Toronto and I saw like um, some protests, people wanting more affordable housing. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting seeing that happening right now. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is crazy, especially to think that rents have come off 10 to 20 percent and we're still talking about affordable housing. I mean, yeah, we have an absolute crisis of affordable housing and in mm-hmm. the GTA especially. Um, and I know CMHC has, has just re- recent, re- recently announced that they're going to be doing some, something to try and get uh, affordable housing built rapidly. So we'll see what happens there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, fingers crossed for everybody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Honestly, I really hope that this is something that we can kind of solve together. I know actually the Fed, the federal government, um, did sort of allude to the fact that they would be willing to purchase distressed assets in the city mm-hmm. to convert to affordable housing. So, I mean, that mm-hmm. might be a, a worthwhile rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time. No problem, Dina. Always a pleasure to speak with you. I really appreciate your time as well, and uh, I appreciate you including me in uh, in this research. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so take much. care. If you have any questions, I'll let you. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great day. Have a great day.